And the word of God says the following. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, and to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what is good. In your teachings, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. May the Lord bless his word. You may be seated. So this morning we're going to continue in our series that we started last week. In this book of Titus, series that we call The One True God. And last week we spoke about the one true God in me. It was talking a little bit about what life was like in the island of Crete. If you remember Paul and uh, Titus, Paul had a journey to Rome, and through his journeys, he had a stop at Crete, and the text doesn't tell us how long he was there, but he was there long enough to see and observe some things, and there long enough to start preaching and proclaiming the one true God, proclaiming Jesus Christ. And he saw that the need that was in the island of Crete And he saw that salvation and forgiveness was needed there. He was there long enough to begin this, but he was also there long enough to say to Titus that the reason Titus had to stay was to straighten out what had had been started. And what had been started was to show the people a different way. What had been started was to show the people that their way of living, their way of believing, that their way of following these false gods of making these idols, of building these altars and worshiping mere men and women was horribly wrong. That they were looking at just people who had lived on this earth and maybe because of their strength or because of their beauty or because of their knowledge or their athletic ability, they stood out above everybody else. And so they were elevated to these positions of honor, these positions of leadership, these positions that they started to worship and adore those people. And their belief was that the island of Crete was the center of the universe, and that is where gods were born. And so they felt that people who had those skills and people that rose, once they died, they became gods. And so that's where they were following and believing those things. How horribly wrong that is. And so that is why Paul, as God by his grace and mercy in his perfect plan, brought Paul and others to the island so that the true God could be preached about and shown to the people who needed to hear about Jesus. And he did this by proclaiming that Christ is the Messiah. And he did this to show them a contrast between how they were living, what they were believing, and what the truth was. These things that they believed, these things that they were following, Even some of the people who were teaching these things and some of the people who who were believing these things knew they weren't true. It was a strange situation, but they still believed in those things. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says this. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Imagine that. Leaders of this community who really weren't even believing what they were teaching. It's kind of like what we see in our world today. If we look at our leaders, many of them, especially now that social media is such a popular avenue to show things, we have people who say this is how we should live. This is what we should do. This is what I'm doing. But then you find out they're hypocrites and they're doing other things, contrary to what they're saying should be done. Things that are, they think are hidden are brought out to the light for others to see. Why? Because of a sinful nature. Because we're flawed men and women. 
Because we live in this flesh that desires the things of this world. And Paul saw what was going on and he said, no, they need to know the one true God. And that is Jesus Christ. And that's who we're going to teach about. That's who we're going to preach about. And so Titus, you're staying here to continue this work. And as we spoke last week, it's interesting because Titus' name in Greek means protector. And that's what he was there to do. Protect the truth of the gospel. And to preach it the way it was being, the way it was to be pre preached and proclaimed. He was saying they had to live a different life. And in chapter 1, it listed out these qualifications for leaders, for elders, for those who were going to be ministers, of how they should live and showing this contrast between the men of Crete versus the men that would be men of God. And it was really not just a list of things for those leaders, but as we spoke, it's for all of us. All of us should represent the kingdom of God the way God wants us to represent it. And those qualifications apply for us as well. Now chapter 2 changes a little bit. Now it's more focused on the pastors, the ministers, the ones who are going to be teaching this word of God. And to teach it in a way that would make the people hear the word and look within themselves. Not to compare themselves against other people, but to look at their life and compare it to God to God's word, to God's truth, to cause a change in them to live a life that would be in align with God's will, not their own will. And so what is the will of God? Well, as we shared last week, Jesus told us what that was. When he spoke in John chapter 6, he said this, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up. In the last day. In other words, the Father's will was that Jesus, his son, would be seen as the one true God and all who believed in him, all who would accept him, all who would follow his teachings and believe in their heart that he is the one true God and confess it with their lips and repent from the life that they were living to a life that he wants them to live would have eternal life. But there had to be godly men and women who were going to follow this path to show the people of Crete this difference. There had to be those who would hear the word, who would understand, and who would follow those teachings. There had to be people who would show them a different way. So suppose one day you decide you're going to go on a vacation. You tell your spouse, honey, we're, you tell your spouse, honey, we're going on vacation. Kids, we're going on vacation. Yay, vacation time. Where are we going? Don't know. When are we leaving? Your guess is as good as mine. Well, then what should we take? Well, I kind of like the snow, so let's take some earmuffs and scarves and coats and jackets and boots, and let's take all that stuff to keep us warm, and you go out, and you end up in Death Valley in the middle of summer. I mean, we kind of chuckle about that, but that's the way this world lives. Not knowing what is at the end. Not knowing where they're going. Not looking at all the signs around us telling us that a day is going to come, that this will end, and we are going to step into eternity. And if we don't know how to get there, if we don't know how to be prepared, we will find ourselves in an eternity that we will regret forever. And that's where the direction that the people of, of Crete were going in. And Paul was saying, telling Titus, find those individuals who are going to recognize that and are going to change and be different. Who would not follow the way that the world was showing them to follow. And that's our first point. Be different because we are. Be different because we are. It sounds simple enough. Oh, we'll just be different. But it's a daily choice that we have to make. It is a decision every day that we have to make to live a life different than what this world and what society and what sin and Satan tell us we should live. We are under attack all the time at all levels. There's constant bombardment of things that we should be doing to satisfy ourselves, to live happy, to be joyous. Things that at all levels happen all the time. But you know, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior... When you follow the teachings of sound doctrine, you become public enemy number one. 
Because Satan and sin doesn't want you to let the public know the one true God and how to live to honor him. That is why Paul tells Titus in verse 1 of chapter 2, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. It has to be the foundation. It has to be his word. It has to be his truth. Nothing has to be added. Nothing has to be taken away. Teach it the way he showed us and the way he wants it to be taught. That is all that is needed. We don't have to add to it. We have to show and encourage each other to follow the word of God. And so over the next part of this chapter, he goes on showing these differences. And he goes on telling what it is that has to be taught. What it is that has to be followed. And he starts, he talks to the men. He talks to the women. He talks about the youth. He talks about those who are free, those who are slave. To all levels of society, all age groups, the word of God applies. And that's what Paul was saying. And he starts with the older men. And he says, starting in verse 2, Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. In faith, not in themselves, not in the world they lived in, not in the things they had, not in material and wealth or knowledge or possessions, a faith in God, the one true God. To also live in love. But it wasn't the love that they knew, the love that they were experiencing, or what they thought was love. He was talking about the love of God, the love that comes from heaven, that kind of love. Love that says, I'm going to love my neighbor, not love that says, I got to watch out for myself, and I'm going to love the things that I have, and I'm going to do what I need to do to make me well, and an endurance. An endurance because we're not in a sprint to the finish line. We're in a journey, in a journey to eternal life, in a journey of this faith, and it is an everyday choice that we have to make. Verse 2 talks to the older men, and we have to remember what was going on in the island of Crete. The general attitude as we read history and as we read information about what was going on in Crete was that the men of Crete were gluttons, they were lazy, liars, they were trying to be with as many women as they could be. They were doing crooked business deals. They were lying to each other and trying to feather their own caps, line their own pockets. They were doing all these mischievous and dirty deeds. And that is the example that was being shown to all the people of Crete. And those who were doing really good at that were being elevated and were being looked upon as leaders. And they were being looked upon that someday they would die and they would become gods. Those were the men that the people were trying to emulate. Those were the habits and the behaviors that they were trying to follow because they believed that those people, after they left this temporal life, somehow could bless them. And in hope that they, when they died, they would find themselves with those gods in their minds. They were just looking how to satisfy themselves. But what did Jesus say? Jesus told us to love the way he loved us, to love one another, to love the way God wants us to love each other. Look what he says in John chapter 13. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All men will know. You know, people are looking for something of truth, something of value. And there's a bunch of stuff being shown out there in all kinds of avenues of where you find satisfaction, where you find joy, where do you find fulfillment, where do you find your self-worth. And it's all a bunch of lies because it's simply found in the love of God, the love that he showed for us, the love that he wants us to show to one another so that the world may see this true love. That comes from the true God. He wanted the people there to live a life that their actions spoke about the love of God, not about how to please self. He wanted the people there to love one another so that others would see there is a difference. And that difference comes because there is a true God and people are following that true God. 
This new way of living, this new way of showing love, it was kind of hard to understand. And how did God show his love to us? How did God demonstrate his love to us? Well, Romans tells us this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How amazing is that? You know, we sometimes forget that God is God. And what I mean by that is that he knows the ugliest David, David could be. He knows the worst person you can be. He knows the horrible person that we can be. When we're around each other, we're proper, we're polite, we're kind, we're generous, we speak with loving words, right? He knows the you when no one is around. He knows me when I'm by myself. He knows my thoughts. He knows my desires. And he still died for my sins. What an amazing God. What an amazing love that that is. That's the love that God wants us to show. That when we are offended, that when we are looked as outcasts, that when we are looked down on, we don't thumb our nose, we don't walk away, we just say... I love you because he loved me. We show each other God's love. That's how the world will know that there is a true God. And this love of God, it allows us to live a life without fear. It allows us to live a life that we can love one another without fear. Because his love is perfect. John, 1 John tells us this in chapter 4, starting in verse 16. And so... We know and rely on the love of God that he has for all of us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. That is the love that is being spoken about. Those who fear is because there's judgment. There's a punishment. For those of us who are a little older, and Matthew today is a little older because he's having a birthday. But remember we were little kids. If we did something wrong, and we knew it was wrong, we didn't want to face mom or dad, or grandma or grandpa, or we didn't want to face our teachers, or face those that are uh, older in our community, because we did something wrong, and we knew we were wrong, and we were afraid of the punishment, we were afraid of the consequence. It was fear that drove that. And some of us felt the consequence on our backside a lot of times. And mom probably wants to give me some of that too, but um, not anymore. It is fear that does that. But when you love God and the, God and the love of God is in you, your sins have been forgiven. You have made, been made right in his eyes. And there now is no fear because that has been dealt with on the cross. Now we can love one another with the love of God and not worry about what others think and not worry about what's going on, but we know that that love that we show, God's love, will let others know there is no fear in the one true God. As Titus is reading this letter that Paul wrote, Paul starts to address other things, and he addresses the women. Now, the women must have been living a life just like the men. Otherwise, there would have been no need to point that out, right? So the women were living lives that were not pleasing to God. The women were doing things that were not appropriate. The women were just probably doing things that we can't mention here. And Paul wanted to address that because he's saying, ladies, you are special. You are precious. God has designed you for a certain purpose, and God has designed you in such a way, and you have such value in your homes, for your husbands, for your children, for your community. 
the things that God has designed you to do has such a great impact in our communities. And it appears that the women were abandoning their husbands, their children, their homes, living in ways that were disgraceful, living in ways that they were being lowered to levels in society, kind of like we see being shown in our world today. Women are used as objects, and they're used to sell things, and they're used to do things that are horrible in the sight of God. And it was happening then, and Paul wanted to address that also with these teachings. Starting in verse 3, he says, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands. Why? So that no one will malign the word of God. There was a reason that Paul was pointing this out. Women were to be reverent. What does that mean? To be honorable, to be decent, to be loving, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be caring, to be everything except what was being modeled for the women of the day. And there must have been enough evidence of this for Paul to see this, to say, hey, we need to find people who are going to teach the Word of God, who are going to live the Word of God, who are going to be different because of God, so that others will see and know that there is a true God who loves them. The women were to live this life that was to be different than what was being modeled. And you know, here at Oasis, we are so blessed. We're blessed because we have, the women here are beautiful, inside and out. Because they live a life that shows the love of Christ. Because they love their husbands, they love their children, they love their community. Because they do things right because they know the Word of God, they encourage each other, they have studies, and they walk with each other to build each other up. Because they set an example in their homes so that their children see the love of God. And they help each other in ways that are amazing. You know, Jenny's family, I spoke to Gina yesterday, she says, you know, I'm so blessed, mom is so blessed, because in the middle of all this, the house has been a mess, and we've been trying to to just have these, you know, be people coming here. We haven't had time. And people, women from Oasis came to our home and cleaned our house for us. And they showed us the love of Christ. In tangible ways, the women here are showing the love of God. Friday afternoon, there was a few of us that gathered here to remember one of the ladies here from Oasis. And in that gathering, her son was speaking about his mom. And he was talking about her life. And throughout the time that he was sharing, there's things that kept coming to my mind that said, a woman of God, a woman of God. He said, you know, as I'm older now and mom's gone, I realize how much mom sacrificed for us, for me and my sister. I realize how much time she could have done things for herself, but she spent with us. The things that he treasured most were the moments he said that In the evenings, mom would shut the world out. She'd turn off the TV, and she would tell him and his sister, get a book. We're going to sit down, and we're going to read together. And they would just spend that time with her children. The things that he remembers that she would take them and spend time with them going out to different events. That instead of her taking care of herself or doing things for herself or going out and and partying and doing other things, she put her children first. And she took care of them. He would recount stories about going to the movies. Sometimes she'd take the daughter. Sometimes she'd take the son. Sometimes both. But she was spending time nurturing and fostering these children. And those are the memories that he remembered. These were qualities that the book of Proverbs teach us. Proverbs 30. That the women here study and talk about and they live out all the time. About the virtuous woman who cares for her husband. Cares for her children cares for her home, cares for the finances, cares for the community, and the blessings that come from that. And at the end of chapter 30, the Bible tells us this. Proverbs 30, verse 29. Many women do notable things, 
but you surpassed them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting. But the woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned, and let her works bring praise at the city gates. Those things, that praise wasn't to worship the women, but to give thanks to God how those women are living a life that reflects the love of God because they were living a life that is different from what the world says they should live. These are not women who are slanderous. These are not women who are given too much wine. These aren't women who abandon their calling, but these are women who love God and want the love of God to be in their home and want the love of God to be shown in the way they live. And that's what Paul was saying. We need to be different. You need to find those individuals who hear the word of God, teach it the way it is to be taught, and who will live out that word of God. Because that way people will know who the one true God is in us. And that's our second point. The one true God in us. The chapter continues to talk about different aspects of the life that was in Crete and how they should live. And we can see and get a picture of what life must have been like and we see it in our own streets. Look at the lawlessness that we're living in. We're, we're to the point where we don't even become shocked at how violent the crimes are that happen in our communities. We're not even shocked at how young some of these criminal acts from children are being done. We're not even surprised anymore. We're becoming numb to those things because it is being accepted it is being tolerated. It is being elevated. It's being excused. It's being justified. And it's a life that doesn't show the one true God. It's a life that doesn't show the love of God. It's a life that was being lived out in Crete. And Paul was saying, no, hope and salvation and the one true God needs to be preached. And needs to be preached the correct way so that the people will know who the one true God is. He, he came to us and he showed us his love because of grace. And that's what he says in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And we need to be men and women of God. We need to live a life that shows this world who Jesus is so they know there is a hope, so they know there is salvation, so they know there is forgiveness, so they know that this life is going to end and what really matters is the eternal life. One day this will end. Where would they spend eternity? And how will they know unless we show them who the one true God is? Paul saw these lost people and said, Titus, we need to work. You need to stay here and make sure that we find men, women, people who are going to believe. And who are going to show a different lifestyle, show a different way. And as we close this morning, Jesus understood that. And Jesus proclaimed that. And Jesus knew that he was going to show us a way, but then we would have to continue that work by allowing him to work in our lives. And there's a time when he's preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, giving these awesome teachings, showing the people how to pray, showing us how to pray, showing the people how to live, showing them what the difference is, showing them what the kingdom of God looks like. And he tells them this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That's what Paul was saying. Find those individuals who are going to let the light of Christ shine in Crete. Find those people who are going to live a life different to show the people there is a different way. And it's not what the world is showing them. Paul was saying, find those individuals who are going to stay focused on what matters, and that is to show the love of God because the one true God is in them and the one true God is, is in us. And for the world to see that, we have to love them and love each other and live a life that brings honor and glory to God. Paul closes by saying this in verse 15. These, then, 
the sound doctrine, the teaching. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. How will the world see the love of God? How will our communities know that there is one true God? How will we be able to reflect the love of Christ? By being different. Every day making that choice. By having the one true God in me and in you as an individual. By having the one true God in us as a corporate body so that this world may see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.